Thank you for joining us for another episode of Bike Life. And I'm super excited to have Ken Francis with us today. And for many of you, you are going to be very familiar with that name because not only has he been an active member and user of Warm Showers from basically the beginning, but he has also been a board member and a volunteer extraordinaire. So having Ken join us today has been something super special that I've been looking forward to. So thank you, Ken, for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Taverly. I'm really touched by what you said. Yeah, well, I, I was saying just prior to recording that um, I definitely miss you on the board because your time has come to a conclusion, but the energy and the information and the passion that you have for the cycling community is, is you know, it's hard to match. So you're, you're an amazing guy. You've been a big part of this organization for a long time. Well, thank you. I, I want to let our, our listeners know that you started cycle touring in the 80s, which is interesting because when you cycled across the United States in 85, 86, and 94, that was all pre-technology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that means there was no access to apps and information. You were using paper maps. <laughs> paper maps. And uh, AAA back then used to have a service where there was one guy who would do a bicycle triptych. You would let him know where you were going to be, and he would kind of be the Google route for bicycles. He would uh, send you these maps that had highlighted where the roads were and, like, let's say right on shoulder, had little stamps on there, right on shoulder, exit freeway. But the irony, I think we used him like three times. The irony was we always ended up getting the maps like three weeks late. (laughs) <laughs> so even though it was a great service and we planned well in advance, it took forever to get. So like you were saying, we're pretty much on our own. So it was things were much, much different then. Mm. Now when I ride my bike and I have Google on, I, I go to sleep at night with Google, the voice in my head saying, you know, turn right in 300 feet. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's funny. And where did you stay? Like, did you have places to stay when you were touring back, you know, pre-technology? Well, the first trip I did cross country in 1985, uh, we we tried to stay in as many campgrounds as possible. Uh, that was kind of the the notion. We would do do some wild camping or stealth camping. Although back then we just called it camping in the bush. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because we met a group of people uh, about halfway through the trip in Wyoming. It was a group of 65 cyclists from Taylor University, and it was a group called the Wandering Wheels. And mm. these cyclists were all college students in this huge group. They had a semi-tractor trailer that had like 50 bunks in it, and mm. they were doing it for college credit. And volunteering doing uh, community service one day a week. And I just thought that was just the most amazing idea. So when I went cross country again, uh, the following year, I, I did more of a, a stopping at churches along the way, city parks. Uh, and then the first trip, I also learned to knock on somebody's door, uh, which coming from a large city like Los Angeles, that was something you used to do. So when one of my friends on the trip said, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to make it to town and it's going to rain. We're going to knock on the next farmhouse door. My, my thoughts were just, you know, they're going to come out and shoot us. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they, not only did they take us in and feed us, I remained in contact with them for several years. I went back and I visited them on the 94 trip. And I learned that uh, the world's really a friendly place as long as you are a friendly person and put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how we did it before the technology. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I I think that that's part of what I like about warm showers is that community aspect still exists today, even though the technology is different. Mm-hmm. The knocking on people's doors and having a place to stay is is still kind of the crux of what we do. The knock is just a little different. Uh, I, right. I, I know when I'm. Riding my bike through farmland, I'm kind of scoping out the houses that I think might might have the best reception for me, and I have the best vibe, and I kind of feel the same way when I'm looking at people's profiles with, you know, who's somebody who's more likely to respond to me, and who's somebody who's going to kind of be a good uh, mesh with me as a, as a, as a guest. So uh, it's just a different type of knock, but, but yeah. similar, yeah. Yeah, I like that. So... So you joined Warm Showers in 2013, correct? Yes. yes. As a volunteer. 
Uh, not right away. And I, I haven't been in from the beginning, which is really interesting. Uh, I've, I've known about warm showers for years, the different incarnations back in the 90s. I never really lived in a house where I felt that I could comfortably host people and really host at the level that I wanted to host. So in 2013, I figured, you know, I have, I have a big enough house. I have a huge yard. The, the, everything is ideal now. I live two miles off the ACA Pacific Coast route. Everything just aligned. And mm. so I joined in 2013. Things were slow the first year. I had only a couple guests the first year. I think I only used it once as a host. And then I contacted uh, Warm Showers back then and just basically said, you know, I really love the opportunity to help out if possible. So that's when I started doing the daily uh, review of the membership. So that was my volunteer stint for, I think, two years before I was actually invited onto the board. And what was it like then? Like, what? How many users did we have? Like, you know, tell us about the beginning because some of us, like me, weren't you know weren't here at that time. So it's always interesting to see how far we've come. Well, it was a small organization, and the founder really wanted to have kind of a one size fits all approach. So he told me, you know, what you're doing is you're looking for spam. Basically, anybody is welcome mm. to come onto the website. You're looking for spam and. Uh, yeah, as, as you know, we do get spam, spam attacks and spammers, so yeah. it was valuable that, that we, we did that. But there were maybe 25, 30 members a day signing up back then. And mm. over the next year or two, it really started to mushroom up to an average of 60. And then like a year or two later in the summer, I think we peaked at uh, a couple times where it was 200 members a day. So it got so voluminous. And I think part of it was it was so easy to sign up. I think they had a 15-word minimum for bio. Mm. And anybody could sign up. And I think we were getting a lot of hollow profiles that way. Mm -hmm. So I pushed to expand the the, the, uh, profile page. So minimum of 50 characters. And you had to mention something about bicycling or hosting to, to be a viable member of the community. But yeah, we know that that's, that's definitely been something we've, so we still struggle with is, um, well, and things are a little different now because we have a, a one-time user fee um, to sign up. But I think that that not only did that cut out some of the span, but it also allowed us to tighten some of the parameters to have some mandatory fields so we can track data. That's one thing now that when you're 170,000 users, now we need to look at the data and we need to say, oh, okay, this, you know, this is the amount of people that tour in this area. This is the amount of people hosting in this area. And then, of course, as you know, because your time on the board, you were, you know, such a big part of the board that we often had to look at the challenge of making sure that the host information that appeared on the map was accurate, which was keeping profiles mm-hmm up to date that's mm-hmm. <laughs> that's always interesting i found that on my last trip i uh pulled up somebody in oregon and in reading their profile they actually were in australia so uh yeah, yeah. okay so for those of you that are listening if you're warm showers users this is a, your nice friendly reminder from your behind the scenes girl to make sure that you go in and update your profile because <laughs> when people are on tour and they are looking for hosts it is vital that your information is up to date and you know we want people to be able to utilize the technology to its fullest capacity and make sure that you have your information correct and we do as much as we can to try to um, take people off the map if they're not active you know we have systems in place as I'm sure all of you know that if you're not active during a certain period of time, we just take you off the map. We don't deactivate your profile. Not yet. (laughs) I think that goes back to what you were saying about uh, pre-technology. The knock on the door, it wasn't just a knock on the door. Before I knocked on the door, I made sure that I kind of looked presentable. And the first thing I would say is I would introduce myself and say, hey, you know, I'm Ken Francis and I'm riding my bike cross country and there's just nowhere to camp in the area. So I'm wondering if it's possible just to pitch my tent somewhere in your field. Okay. Communication. And really, that's what we're putting on the profile, whether it be our profile picture or or what we write up, is we're really communicating uh, to other members who we are and what we're all about. So it's 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 so important that that we have that communication, yeah. and it's accurate, yeah, and current. Very good analogy. I love that. Make yourself presentable before you knock on the door, and you do the same thing digitally. <laughs> Uh, what other suggestions, Ken, do you have when it comes to actually completing your profile? As let's let's start as a host, because I know that you have hosted more than two hundred and fifty cyclists. Yes, yes, wow. I've, I've enjoyed every one of them. Uh, just the, the, 
like I said, the communication, uh, putting down kind of the expectations, uh, you know, house rules, I think are really important. You, you, you don't want to have somebody show up that, uh, and believe me, I've heard horror stories. I've talked to other hosts. I've talked to other cyclists who have hosted before. And sometimes uh, things just really aren't uh, clearly spelled out and people have been very uncomfortable. And uh, I think my biggest spiel is always to, to my guests, leave feedback. Please leave feedback. You know? mm. and I say, you look at mine, I've got more feedback than I need, but it's not about that. It's about, hey, uh, warm showers having the metrics of who stays mm. with who. Mm. And the other thing is, you know, you're communicating yourself as well by how you leave the feedback. So mm. um, I think leaving feedback is a huge part of the communication. Mm. Important tip. Yeah, I really love that you're including that because it's something that, you know, we don't have a, let's say like a forced mechanism where people Mm -hmm. are required to like, you know, leave feedback. So a lot of online services you use now, as soon as you complete a purchase or a stay or something, you're sent automatically to a menu to leave feedback. And that we, we have that goal in the future, but if you're listening, make sure that you do leave feedback both um, for the cyclist and for the host, because it does allow other people to kind of get a sense, right? And it also shows some validation that an exchange of hospitality has taken place. I think being unique is also important. Uh, uh, my friend Sue, who hosts down uh, in San Diego, Coronado, she makes earrings out of old inner tubes. And they're actually kind of kind of cool looking. And her guests always get to, to pick an earring. Um, I've had other, other hosts that do other unique things with their people. I know... Uh, depending on the weather and the time of the year. Oftentimes, if the cyclists that come in aren't too tired, we will take them on a kayak paddle across the bay and have dinner somewhere, you know, in Long Beach and then paddle back in the dark, which is a huge treat for people who mm. have never either kayaked or gone night kayaking before. So, you know, doing something unique and special to, to make a really viable memory for the cyclist is important or, or for the guest. Ken, that is extraordinary that you are definitely talking now about creating memories and exchanges with people that you might not have otherwise even had the chance to meet. I've, I've done things with my uh, guests such as, uh, and I don't do this with everybody, so I'm not throwing this out there, stay with me and I will take you to Disneyland. <laughs> but I have taken a couple of my guests to Disneyland before. Uh, wow. uh, I've gone to Hollywood. I'm fairly close to the public transportation, so I've had many guests stay with me more than one night, and what they'll Mm. do is they'll walk over to uh, our metro and take that into Hollywood. A lot of people want to see Hollywood. I tell them, I go, you know, plan on spending an hour there. There's not much to see, and you want to get out real quick. But, but, you know, go to Hollywood. You can hike up to the Griffith Park Observatory, walk through downtown L.A. So a lot of people have done that. I had a couple guests even ride their bicycles to Disneyland. I'm about 16 miles from there, and it's a straight shot down one road. And they said, let's do it. So, um, so yeah, and, and I've had so much fun doing that stuff. It really, uh, if, if I'm grounded and I'm not traveling, I'm traveling vicariously through my guests. And yeah. It's just, uh, it, it makes it memorable. But so now let's talk about you being a touring cyclist because you've toured mm-hmm. over North America and in Europe, correct? And Australia, yes. And Australia. So let's talk about some of your favorite memories and experiences being on tour. Oh, there's so many. I would say uh, I really resisted going to Europe for, for years. Uh, I was traveling all over California for one thing in the beginning in the 80s and then going cross country. Just North America just has so much uh, to see and do that I really resisted going anywhere else until finally I, I hit Europe when I hit 50. And was just so amazed that I've been back several times, and I love the Eurobella routes there, uh, which are the American ver- or the European versions of the American Adventure Cycling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done the Rhine River, done the Danube, uh, Iceland, and uh, like like Iceland was not somewhere I ever thought I would ever be. I wow. thought Iceland is is the little thing that you fly over on the plane right. and go to Europe. Right. It's a stopping and, place. And I had a, a guest one year who was talking to me and he'd been like cycling around the world. And I told him that I was kind of getting to an age where I was thinking about maybe not touring so much anymore. And he just looked at me and he said, Ken, go to Iceland. You would love Iceland. Go to Iceland. So I went to Iceland. Uh, 
So I would say a lot of the European adventures, I'm incorporating two of my loves now. I'm incorporating the, the cycle touring with roller coasters. So wow. uh, on the Rhine River, I was able to stop and go to Europa Park and Fantasia Land and ride some of the biggest roller coasters in Europe. Uh, this June, I was planning on riding across Ohio and hitting some theme parks, but because of COVID-19 and all the closures, I kind of changed my plans and did a, a trip across the Southern Cascades instead, something a little more remote, a little bit safer. Uh, the roller coasters hopefully will be there next year. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I, I've i interviewed a couple of individuals that have had different focuses for their tours, and one woman... Um, she made specific stops for uh, – she was looking at following authors and their journeys when they were doing mm-hmm. writings mm-hmm. and stuff. So it's, I, it's just so interesting how you can learn so much when you're touring. So it's not, it's not just the fresh air in your face. It is that. <laughs> but it's also the things you can see along the way and the experiences you can have. Well, in 85, I had some goals. One of my goals was to milk a cow. And okay. <laughs> I was getting towards I was getting towards Boston towards the end of the, the trip, oh and I hadn't done it yet. And I saw I saw a, a, a dairyman with his herd of cows crossing the street, and I I quickly cycled up and I dumped my bike in the drive and I ran up to him and like a fool I asked him, you know, do you need any help? You know, this is something this guy's been doing every day. <laughs> do you need any help? So it was my way of saying I really want to learn how to milk a cow. So. I, I stayed there. I spent the night in his field and he showed me how to milk a cow, but he did everything uh, with the electronic. So I kind of learned how to hook the cows up to the machines, but I never really mm-hmm. learned how to milk a cow. So the next year when I went cross country, I had seen the movie witness and I wanted to see Amish people because I just couldn't believe that people like that still existed. So through a series of events, I ended up meeting one family who introduced me to another family who introduced me to another family. And then I ended up basically staying with the Pennsylvania Dutch uh, for a couple of weeks and uh, three different families. And I learned how to milk a cow. You really have to have strong By hand for that. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah, really. It was like, that was a one and done for me. Uh, but I met those people back in 1986, and I fly back every year to visit them. Uh, they are family. I am family to them. I've watched their kids grow up. Wow. Their, their grandkids all think of me as a cousin and an uncle, and I just have the most amazing experience back there. And they're always proud. They're always like, this is the kid who rode his bike cross country, and we met him way back in 1986. Uh, but meeting them changed my life. And I think that's a big part of my push with hospitality is that these people just totally opened the world up in their home up to me and just made me feel important. And I know how that felt. And that's part of what I like to repay with being a host and being part of warm showers. Mm, yeah. Well, that's what makes this really special. And and thank you so much for sharing that, Ken, because that's, you know, it's easy it's easy for those of us like you and I who work at the governance level and mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to kind of lose touch of how important that piece is. And that's what this podcast is about is to keep us all connected, especially right now while we are experiencing a lot of non-touring because of uh, living through a pandemic. And I want to ask you your thoughts about that. How do you feel about what's happening with touring right now? And, and what do you see that people can do to, um, I just want to, I want to use the word maybe supplement long distance touring right now with other types of touring? What do you suggest people could do? Well, first, let me say through the pandemic, uh, being a member of Warm Showers has just changed how I am coping for one thing, because I've hosted people from all over the world and I'm still in contact with them. And being able to hear how other countries are handling the virus uh you know we might think that we have hardships here but then when i talk to friends in italy who say you know hey we can go out of the house luckily for two hours twice a week if we're going to the store the doctor the pharmacy and that's it uh realizing this is global and we're all in this together so i've it's helped me to be in better contact with former guests and former hosts Mm -hmm. uh that's one thing i think also i am planning future trips. Uh, Like I said, I rerouted my trip from uh, Ohio to the Cascades because I thought that's something that's kind of been on my to-do list. It wasn't really a roller coaster trip, but it it worked out. 
Uh, unfortunately, the trip that I'm planning on doing with my friend Philip in September was we were going to ride our bicycles from Zurich to Barcelona, mm-hmm. taking some trains along the way and hitting a couple theme parks. Uh, but that trip right now is going to be on hold till next year. So what we're doing is we're looking at kind of projecting ahead. What's going to be the safest place? What's the weather wise? What's a part of the country maybe we haven't been in before? So we're looking at something like uh, maybe Flagstaff to El Paso, Texas, or maybe something around Texas, Big Bend area. But uh, just looking at seeing where it is possible to travel and make sure that uh, we maximize and, and, and do what we can. It would be horrible to to not do any cycling. I, I think it's still yeah. possible to get out there and yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah, and I do think that a lot of people are staying local within their own country, of course, right now, because um, there are so many travel restrictions in place. And I like that idea of looking at more remote remote ways of traveling. I mean, you might some warm showers guests um, are able to host, and some are not. Um, or hosts are able to host, some are not, and some just aren't comfortable. And so that's you know it might take a little bit more work to find a place to stay. But yet I do we do see a lot of hosts offering camping space at the very least, right? Even if they're not comfortable with people coming into their home that they might be able to provide camping space. And so we're, we're looking at lots of ways of encouraging people to still stay active. And I love that you brought up staying in touch with people that you've met in the past. That's a great way to keep your, you know, to keep your memories fresh and a pre-planned something for 2021, because this is going to pass. And my, my, my alternate trip in June was I cycled from Seattle to Lake Shasta and kind of zigzagged across the Cascades four times. And I did find four hosts along the way, and we practiced social distancing. And uh, one host, I had this huge storm coming into town where I actually got sleeted on, and it was so windy I couldn't even ride for about 15, 20 minutes. One of those periods where you just have to stop and stand there and be miserable until it blows over. And she said to me, you know, if the weather's going to be horrible tomorrow, you're going over another mountain pass, and there's a chance that you're going to get snowed on, so why don't you just stay another day? Uh, and then I had, I think, three hosts on the trip that weren't able to host, but they all gave me excellent information as far as routing and local campgrounds. So mm-hmm. uh, so even if they're not able to host, they were still able to communicate and, and help me out. And I really appreciated that. Mm, power of connection right there. Power of connection. Nice. So, so tell us what's coming next. So you're going to plan a new trip for next year. You're going to do something locally in September. Yeah. And tell us, I mean, you keep saying the Cascades. For those that aren't from the area, explain what that is. Uh, The Cascades are a mountain range. They're basically a series of volcanoes that extend from southern British Columbia in Canada, uh, kind of down the Pacific coast into northern California. Mm. Uh, Those are the Cascades. Uh, the, The interesting thing about the trip in Zurich is one of the reasons we want to start in Zurich is there's a woman that I met uh, warm showers who lives in Basel, Switzerland. And when I was reviewing daily memberships, she was a new member and her profile said, I will be hopefully coming down the California coast next year. So I sent her a little welcome to warm showers memo and said, uh, you know, you're welcome to stay here when you, when you do your ride. And also I'm going to be doing the Rhine river in a couple months. And I'm wondering if you'd be able to host. So I, totally forgot that I sent it to her, never heard anything back until about a week before the trip. She wrote me and she said, are you still thinking of coming? So uh, we did. We stayed with her. We stayed with her one night, uh, hung out the next morning because it was drizzling a little bit and had a late start, but we remained in contact. Uh, She's come to visit me here. She met all my friends. So when a group of us were in Rome a couple of years ago, she flew to Rome and spent five days in Rome with us. So I talked to her uh, a couple times a week through the internet. She's a great friend. So I look forward to seeing her. And then I have another friend in uh, the outskirts of Amsterdam, who's a warm showers host. So I ended up not only staying with once, but twice. Wow. Uh, amazing host. And she was going to come down the California coast this year. She had uh, something unfortunate come up, but hopefully I get to host her next year. And I'm so excited about that. You know, when you, when you stay with somebody, not only once, but they're kind enough to open up their house to you twice. Uh, I really want to repay that. and uh, look forward to hosting her hopefully next year. So those are the things I'm looking forward to. I love it. It's like your community, your friendship circle, your family has all expanded just through your love of bicycle touring. Mm -hmm. I got a a 
email from one of my previous guests uh, last year. She had come through here. She was from Canada and ended up going to Australia and then New Zealand. And one night she said that she was in the campground with uh, the German cop. If anybody knows me, know the German cop. And she said, we were talking. We realized we both stayed with you. And I was like, okay, well, I want to see a picture of the two of you together. I want, I want proof that you two rendezvoused. And she sent a, f- a few pictures to me. And that was really heartwarming to see that there's like this, you know, six degrees of separation but actually with warm showers it's more like two or three degrees of separation when i stay with somebody and i look at who has left them feedback and i see that that might be somebody that i've stayed with before or somebody that i've hosted it's really kind of a warm feeling when when you realize the connections of the community and this is a community Mm. i love it so much thank you ken thank you for First of all, thank you for wearing your fabulous warm showers hat because you have this your style and this this logo style hat that we made four years ago before my time, and it's <laughs> it's so cool. And thank you for you know joining us and sharing your wisdom and your stories. You know we we definitely appreciate everything you have done for this organization. And folks, if you have not met Ken Francis yet, um, go check out his profile. We'll put his link in in the show notes. And is there any parting words that you want? to share with our community. I just love the expression, you know, we don't stop touring because we get old. We get old because we stop touring. And Mm -hmm. that's something that uh, I know most of the people that come through are young. And uh, I know that I was very vulnerable when I was young and traveling and people took care of me. And that's why I'm, you know, paying this forward to those people. Um, But, you know, we've hosted people our age and older and you know it's it's for everybody it's 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 just such a great way to yes. to, to to see the world so um so, so keep riding keep traveling life gets hard but uh it doesn't mean that we have to stop 